Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Policy Talks, where we talk to uh, interesting business people and policymakers. We have in the past done many episodes with uh, policymakers who've been involved with either executing or making education policy. Today, we are going to look at uh, this particular sector from the unique perspective or from the perch of uh, Mr. Pramad Sina, who has been uh, involved with setting up uh, more universities than possibly any individual in the country till date. He's actively involved with Ashoka University. He has been in the past involved with ISB, Anand University, uh, Vedika, JK Lakshmi, uh, Path University in Jaipur, and also, you know, the National Rail and Transportation Institution at one point or the other. He also serves as an advisor to various uh, non-profit uh, institutions and organizations. And he's actively, you might say, also runs media entities. So he has his, he wears several hats and um, he carries them off successfully because I think uh, at the core of his being, he's a consultant. So uh, he's able to do that. Uh, welcome to the show, Pramad. Thank you. Thank you, Tish. Thank you for, thank you very much for having me. So, uh, you know, you just sold off one of your uh, educational ventures, Harappa, and you have taken, uh, you've uh, taken the chair of trustees at Ashoka Universities. So tell us a little, what else are you working at the moment and what is challenging in your view at this point in time? Sure. Uh, so uh, while it was reported that I have sold off Harappa, and technically it's true, Harappa has with Upgrad. So I continue to work on Harappa. Uh, I'm wow. very excited about what I started to do at Harappa. And it was uh, just opportune that there was an opportunity to merge with a larger entity like Upgrad. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm now accelerating several things that I had wanted to do at Harappa, including entering the United States, oh, okay. uh, opening a, yeah, opening up a, a school of leadership, uh, both of which we have just announced in the past 10 days or so. I'm actually sitting in the US because I'm here for meeting potential clients for Harappa. So Harappa continues to be a big part of my life and will be for the next few years, uh, now as part of our grad. And also working very closely with the Upgrad founders to contribute wherever I can. So I do see that as a big part of my life going forward. And part of it is because I've always been very keen on both understanding and engaging with technology as a means to deliver higher education and quality higher education. I think we have no choice as a country uh, if we don't embrace technology, we just will not be able to deliver quality higher education to the large numbers who will need it. Uh, and I think it's going to be a core pillar of our economic growth going forward. But we'll talk more about that later. I continue to be very involved in both Ashoka, uh, where I think I spend a lot of my time also, uh, as well as to some extent ISB. Uh, these are two institutions amongst the many that you mentioned that uh, are very close to my heart, but also ones that I've helped build from the ground up. Uh, and in that sense, I'm truly a founder uh, in, in both these with many others. So I do see that as a, a major responsibility, but also I'm very excited by the fact that we can actually take both these institutions to truly world-class levels. I think they are already world-class, but I think in terms of their reputation as you know, the top institutions out of, out of India, there's a lot more we can do. Uh, and so that's what I want to devote uh, a lot of my time to. So basically Harappa uh, and then Ashoka and ISP, which were the two institutions that I founded earlier. So, you know, it's interesting that you talk about technology uh, and, uh, you know, using technology and you're working actively in Harappa, which is a, a technology platform to deliver soft skills. Uh, and that's very interesting and uh, fascinating at several levels. Uh, but I mean, fundamentally, if you look at the structure of uh, education or especially higher education in the country, and you have your feet also in an old school structure of, you know, brick and mortar, which is Ashoka and ISB, 
and you have one foot in uh, a technology based platform and these two worlds are basically uh, diverging um, quite actively uh, in that sense i mean you know these stats as well as anybody else you know there is a school of thought which says that you know higher education in the brick and mortar world in india particularly and of course you can argue for the rest of the world separately i mean we have 677 odd in you know universities we have 37000 odd colleges we have you know, more than enough smaller educational institution in that sense but higher education in these brick and mortar institution is collapsed or is collapsing depends upon who you ask but fundamentally they are not producing students who are either employable or who can be employed you know the statistics uh, tell a very you might say dreary story about the higher education institution in the country so the question is do you think that you know you you spend almost now i think close to uh, 2008 onwards you've been in, on the higher education side do you think that these islands of excellence that you are building in nashoka and uh, isb and uh, several other is capable of solving the problem at scale that the country faces so there are several questions in your question and several answers yeah. in there also i think the the two have to coexist yatish uh, there's yeah. no doubt in my mind that we have to do both and that in in essence uh, picks up on your last point that these islands of excellence and even if we vastly expand the brick and mortar part my belief is that it will never quite be able to bridge the gap that we see today uh, because building that many classrooms and finding that many teachers which is the current education model across the world which is the prevalent model that has been around for the last almost 2000 years yeah the scale at which we have to do it in our country in particular let's not go elsewhere for a minute but just focus on india with yeah. 25 million kids being born every year and i don't know about half of those or a third of those graduating from school every year many of them aspiring for a higher education we are just not geared up for the numbers the government as you know has said that they would like to double ger to about 50% yeah. by 2040 now i think that g still modest for a country uh, of our maturity in most countries are at 60 70% ger but be that as it may even getting to 50% ger or the higher number uh, is going to be a huge challenge in the old brick and mortar model and that's where my belief is that you will need to leverage and add the technology based delivered education to whatever is created in the brick and mortar side because the brick and mortar side will just not be enough so you will need both now on the technology side i personally believe that if done right and this is where i think there's a huge opportunity for india as a country and indian entities and universities uh, we can really innovate in delivering only high quality education using technology because technology enables you to do that uh, you can take one course on one subject and make it really high quality and offer it to everyone there is no variability by location or by teacher and i can talk more about why i believe that but i think the the advent of online digital learning is as fundamental and as profound as the use of textbooks uh from uh, 700 years ago when the printing press was invented and how that spread education around the world so remember that But do you think that i mean the online digital learning model uh, in whatever form i mean whether it exists as a as a free form in a khan academy uh, or or it exists in a harappa form or a udemy form or you know any of these the uh, byju form is actually able to address the 25 million population set with skills that are needed by them yes or is there a, is in there fact, a, on skills 
on skills, it's the best thing to use, right? I mean, that is why you see the growth of these online education companies in the higher. I mean, if you look at Upgrad's growth, uh, it's really because it's very focused on the skills that are in demand. So for skilling, we have already, this model is already proven, right? And in fact, you're going to, as you know, the world is changing so fast that you are going to need to unlearn and relearn skills throughout your life now. Yeah. So how do you do that? Because you can't keep going back to the brick and mortar campus each time, taking time off from work or even if you part time, it's very tough to do that. So the online world has already arrived. It's pe young people today are already taking a data science course and seeing a, a, a section of the society. Pramod. I mean, still, it's still, I mean, I know there are people who are taking data science courses. I mean, like, no, I have taken data science course. My children would take data science course. Mm -hmm. But if I go, uh, I mean, a few income levels down, uh, I mean, both the access and the pricing do not allow you to take a data of science course. course. So, well, I mean, so well, that, that is the base. So we, were, we are looking at that base. We are not looking at the top of the pyramid where, uh, you know, access is not an issue. Uh, pricing is not an issue. Uh, totally uh, agree so with where we are right now. Right now, you are at the top of the pyramid. Yeah. Even so, I would say that a lot more people are able to access than they would have been able to access brick and mortar because the cost of Ex what you are able to get online is much lower. Now, your point is, how do we cater to the masses? And I think that is a much larger question which we can talk about. I think public education also has to embrace technology in the same way uh, as uh, some of the more commercial uh, ventures have. We haven't yet seen the advent of technology in a material way in the non-profit and the public education world, right? Uh, right now, what you have seen is, and it happens with every innovation, what you've seen is companies that are for profit. And so they have to obviously price things at a certain level. They have to uh, yeah. make profits. Yeah. But what I'm talking about is not the commercialization of it, but so more about the fundamental use of the technology. So let's discuss that part of it, the public technology part of it, which would enable education at scale. And uh, you know the whole world of digital public goods, which has been created uh, very well in the nonprofit world. And it's being used by at least the Indian government very actively to deliver services uh, is there a role for digital public technology to deliver education at scale in India? And if so, yes, what, what would be the structure and framework of that? So I don't have all the answers. I'm, uh, while you called me into a policy podcast, I, I've always stayed away from policy. My way of uh, contributing is to set up institutions by example. Uh, so I don't want to be offering advice without having uh, thought it through or having the expertise, but I'll give you some uh, uh, sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, the truth is that the government has always had the Indira Gandhi National Open University. It has the largest enrollment of any university in the world the last time I looked. Uh, you can check on the numbers, but I think it runs into millions. Yeah. Now, I think they had the physical open education, open university model, but I adding online courses and online degrees quite rapidly. Uh, there is the Swayam initiative uh, that has been started a while back. I don't remember exactly how many courses there are on Swayam today, but they run into thousands uh, as, uh, as you would find on a Coursera or any commercial platform. Yeah. Uh, and these are largely free, if I'm not mistaken, with a small contribution from uh, people if they want certification. Yeah. Uh, you may have heard that uh, the government has now allowed some of the top universities to start offering online degrees. Uh, so one of the most early initiatives in this was the IIT Madras Masters in Data Science. Uh, I think that's pretty revolutionary that an IIT would offer a master's degree uh, uh, to uh, to people uh, in the last budget with degrees versus skills or diplomas. So I mean, like <laughs> yeah, so so don't get into some of the cultural barriers. Okay. You can't. No, I'm saying that these barriers will exist. Uh, 
uh, we have to solve them, right? Uh, the fact is there's a barrier to access, there's a cultural barrier, and all of those things we have addressed. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that in the last uh, budget, uh, the government has announced a digital university, uh, yeah. which uh, I believe the Ministry of Education is working on. I did some work towards a similar idea during the pandemic uh, with mm -hmm. the Niti Aayog uh, to develop the concept of uh, a digital university. So I know that there are all these initiatives that will ultimately add and essentially what they're all doing is making sure on the and the government owned institutions adopt technology in higher education in a big way uh, one other thing i forgot to mention is the fact that uh, in a blended format the government is allowing institutions to offer 40 percent of their courses through the online mode so this is all telling you that there's an acceptance of digital learning from the point of view of the public good. And uh, I think it will be great to see where the digital university ends up, where uh, I think the, the same kind of infrastructure that has been created for payments or for identity or for health could be created for education as well. Yeah. If you so, look at so let, let, let's education... Pause. Let's pause there yeah. for a moment because that is the uh, crucial area. So we know that these... And these initiatives exist in the public sector or the government sector. You know, IGNO has been in existence for 30 years and SWAM has been there for some time. And there is a digital learning university. But And then there is a parallel initiative by the private sector. And the quality typically resides in the private sector in the sense that they are far more better at delivering quality. They, are, uh, they might be higher on the pricing side, but they're better at delivering quality, especially in emerging areas while the government initiative lag the private sector in terms of delivering quality or in terms of attracting even quality talent in today's world and somewhere this needs to come together if you need to deliver a scale uh, correct and there needs to be some platform or something why does it need to come together why because, does it need to come because, together I don't because, understand. Uh, because if you are to solve this problem in our foreseeable lifetime then uh, one initiative would never do i mean like a private sector initiative at whatever scale will never be able to address a 25 million people challenge and a government level at any scale will never attract those 25 million people because quality exists at one scale no so sorry so i think you are saying that no so you are saying both should do I, when you said come together i i was thinking about merging you they're not i mean of course everybody should do this both should do it no yeah both should do it but they have to i mean like so yeah. somewhere there has to be an interface which uh, allows you to transfer from one to another like for instance there i'm a student and i want to and i'm enrolled in say bharti dasan institute of technology in chennai and I want to do now, I want to kind of transfer into a credit where I think there's quality at- uh... So the government has created all that infrastructure. That infrastructure has been created. The transferable credits, the credit yes, banks- between, between the, degrees- All that, has been, been, all that degrees. has been done. Yeah, all but, that is, but the, all that is that happening. happening? Of course it is, it will happen. I mean, it is a stated goal in the NEP and yeah. uh, it has been talked about even before the NEP. Uh, and it will happen. See, these changes take time. You're trying to turn around a massive ship. Uh, so the new things that you will see coming uh, will be easily able to make these uh, credits and, uh, you know, uh, what do they call the academic bank of credits, but also uh, I'm escaping the word that make the credits transferable from one university to another, one institution to the other. That is already coming. In fact, that has been declared. Institutions have been asked to do that. And amongst the private institutions, it happens anyway. Uh, when, when you take a degree from one college and say, I can apply to another college, in a way, you are transferring credit, saying, I'm going to give you credit for that. So I think all of these changes will happen uh, quite rapidly, is my view. Uh, I think there's realization that these things you have to make. But again, you know, in a world which is not about degrees, even credits won't matter so much. I think we are again thinking degrees, right? If you look at where people are uh, are going, uh, they are saying, listen, when you say basic degree, ho gaya, wo chalo, education, ho gaya, degree mil gaya. but after that, what skills do I need? And, and that's where I think the younger generation thinks very differently, Yatish, from our generation. We used to have this sense that you do 10 years of college, two years of plus, 10 years of school, two years of plus two, then your graduation, and then you're done. Right? Maybe somebody, some people did masters. 
But this generation has realized that it's not just about that. In fact, that's just the start that I'm going to have to constantly keep going back to pick up things. Uh, it's a little bit like, you know, you change your clothes every few years, uh, yeah. or fashion changes, demands changes. So I think that mindset of lifelong learning has already been implanted in people. And part of this comes just from newer opportunities that come. Uh, I have a content person today in Harappa who wants to leave because uh, she's getting a much bigger job to go and work in marketing. Now, for her to move, I think she will need to learn marketing skills. She will need to learn digital marketing skills. And I think she will just learn online. In fact, yeah. people like her and so much demand that they don't want to take time off to go study somewhere or even do uh, a degree. So they'll yeah. say, listen, uh, let me take this job and whatever I don't know, uh, it's like taking a book from a library. Uh, I will go and learn it online. Yeah, that change in behavior is certainly happening, but the change in behavior is happening at a lag effect in the policy side. Uh, I mean, as you said, it takes um, time. But for that isn't that true? Isn't move. that true for yeah? Isn't that true for all uh, sectors, all policy, all governments, right? Because mm -hmm. so you are you are trying to ask that question because it is not. I mean, like uh, it used to be true, but uh, like for instance, uh, the, the thing that has changed, at least in the last six, seven years is that, for instance, payments, you know, we saw the policy falling it has really not yet come out, but payment industry has been changed and not, it's not been changed by the players, it's been changed by the regulator. But similarly, in telecom, we've seen uh, India moving differently on uh, both the policy and the auction. You know, the policy draft has come out now, but the 5G auction has already happened and people are, you know, have launched services. I see. So, there's a, yeah. there's so a, you've lost me on this. Yeah. So you've lost me on this one. I don't know where the policy is and where the state of the art is. Uh, I I thought you were making a general point and I was making a general point that, yeah, these things happen. There's always a lag or a lead. Uh, maybe by creating the digital university, uh, maybe by, I know that uh, the government for itself is doing a lot of things that what the work that the capability building commission is doing yeah uh, or there was a there's a platform that they've created for training of government employees yeah, yeah. Uh, i forget the name now but uh Miti headed by abhishek singh uh, this was the yeah. old i got platform which is now transforming into a skilling platform for government employees yeah it's part uh, of i the see these as a massive mess yeah i see this as and uh i think that uh it's uh, the intent is very clear and i think it has to uh, be seen as really forward thinking now of course with all of these things the uh, the proof comes down to implementation and i think uh, this is also a lot about behavior change mind you uh, we were talking a lot about the younger generation but getting people in our generation or you know some somewhat younger people to us we are about to uh, transition out of the workforce but uh, the next generation, I think getting them to adopt these technologies to, to learn online is tough. Uh, it's not easy. It's people are not used to sitting at a computer and learning. Yeah. Uh, so these are all challenges that will have to be addressed as we go forward. So, so when you look at, you know, from your perch at Ashoka, from when you started and now that you are, I, I think you'll you'll become a multidisciplinary university in that sense you know and um, i think the same will happen to isb if it has an aspiration of being a university uh, and most universities uh, in the private sector would be in that frame of mind you know that uh, especially the technology run or the liberal arts or one course or one degree offering uh, institution that how do they become multidisciplinary universities what is the challenge you see within within the university or within the university ecosystem to become a multidisciplinary institution? Well, I think the big issue uh, is finding faculty everywhere. I think the model that you need people who are trained academics to come and teach, uh, which I believe you do uh, in, in disciplines to a large extent, uh, requires us to have high quality academically trained people and uh, that is in you know in, in massive scarcity around the world but particularly so in india so now if you want everyone to become multidisciplinary by the way which i think is the right way to go uh, 
I think the biggest challenge is going to be finding faculty. I think somewhat of a second challenge is going to be, you see, Atish, it's not just about creating multiple disciplines, but it's also about getting them to truly interact with each other so that the student gets the benefit of the multiple disciplines. Yeah. So that the student gets a truly interdisciplinary experience rather than a multidisciplinary experience. Uh, and I think that's the big mindset shift which is required. And for that, existing faculty and existing administrators will have to change their mindset. Because what is happening is that traditional disciplines, the boundaries between them are getting blurred or rather People are, if you want to solve a real world problem, then you have to use multiple disciplines to solve the problem. So if you really want educated, university educated people to solve the world's problems or real problems. Yes, that's right. That's they, right. they need to be, they need to understand that, you know, just by doing a BSc in biology or even a BA in history, pure history, I'm not going to be so relevant. Yeah. Uh, that biology person needs to understand today uh, data analysis because bio has become all about data, uh, needs to understand uh, anthropology or, or environment because climate is driving a lot of what is happening in biology and health, right? So the way the world's climate changes are happening. Similarly, a history person too uh, is trying to analyze texts using computers data uh, and looking at data so i think the melding of different disciplines is the reason why we use the word multidisciplinary in our nep and so on it's that sense yes to build a full university and to roll out multiple disciplines but getting people to collaborate and to break down these typical department or discipline boundaries is going to be really the key to capture the full benefit of multidisciplinary institutions so how easy or how difficult uh, this is in an academic setup, which is hierarchical by definition uh, and uh, fiefdom oriented by culture in the sense that I had the physics department, I had the chemistry department, and um, and you, you're saying that institutions now need to think uh, interdisciplinary, not just uh, from a structural point of view, but even the faculty and the students have to think interdisciplinary. How is your, how difficult is this problem to solve? In existing institutions, Yatish, it is difficult uh, because uh, any traditional institution is always designed around departments, schools. Uh, you know, there may be some agglomeration into a institute or a center within a large university, but they tend to be the primary access is usually the department. Yep. And the department affiliation becomes your primary affiliation. Some, kind, some cases, like I said, from there it goes to school, but it's still very hierarchical. And that school becomes an entity in itself within the large institution or university. Getting them to change is difficult, I think. Uh, and this is not to say that, this is not to be critical, but the fact that academics are trained to be that way, you know, yeah. I was a PhD once and I was trained to be in my discipline. In fact, when I came out, I did a very interdisciplinary PhD 35 years ago and I was always questioned that which discipline are you? Because I did robotics and by at that time, robotics was not a discipline. Uh, it still isn't because it's a multi, by definition, it requires multiple disciplines. So I think that if you have not worked in multidisciplinary areas already as a scientist or as a uh, researcher or an academic or scholar, uh, then it becomes very difficult for you to suddenly now become uh, multidisciplinary. But I think the, some of the positive ways of doing that uh, are to create interdisciplinary centers which Life require person. people to which I, require I, people to collaborate. Yeah. Go so, I, I mean, I was looking at the University of Toronto first, and they set up a school of cities, and it's a, it's a horizontal school instead of a vertical school. So, every so there's environmental science guys coming in, there is civil engineering guys coming in, there is um, biology uh, department coming in, there is uh, the agro and forestry guys coming in. 
and the school of city which actually the dean of the school of city is uh, is himself a multidisciplinary guy he does not report to each of any of these departments he actually reports to the board of trustees of the university of toronto absolutely is that absolutely. the way is that the horizontal way to kind of build bridges yes so that's exactly yeah that's exactly what i was starting to talk about also these these the idea of centers centers of excellence within a university that by definition has a focus area and that focus area by definition in turn requires expertise from multiple areas so when you do a center around cities that's what happens we have for example at ashoka a center for climate change and sustainability now 29 faculty are associated with that center from nine different departments and they are working on seven different problems right problems that have to do with the environment to problems that have to do with health uh, to uh, problems that have to do with uh, technologies so i think those that is one way that has become quite popular and prevalent and people are seeing the success of that then what you also do is you attract funding and projects to that center which then creates incentives for faculty to work as part of that center on these projects and for uh, accessing this funding which then requires them to collaborate and work together with each other so that's really one way of doing it so i mean if you were to look at the priorities uh, you said the faculty acquisition of course remained the priority and that problem quality of faculty is always been a challenge but is there a any you know, solution around uh, addressing that problem say for uh, the new freedom for hiring this is the practice in that segment yes so i think that yeah so i was going to say that therefore recognizing that this whole an initiative by the ugc to allow professors of practice is a very welcome one because there are certain courses or certain subjects certain content that can also be delivered by practitioner uh, that can also be delivered by people who necessarily don't have a phd or a research record so this allows you to have a healthy mix of people to teach any pro on any program or any course where you have a bunch of people who are traditional academics who are scholars who have uh, done phd's and there are others who by their dint of experience are also able to bring very valuable knowledge and content and learning for students in the classroom so if i were to summarize and then technology based learning also helps right so you add that to the mix also so that also adds to the need so if i were to summarize your thinking on this uh, on new universities or private universities addressing the issue of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary three things broadly comes in that they need to create a interdisciplinary center of excellence which is horizontal in nature and they need to be more cognizant of uh, technology platforms and professional or uh, professors of practice in building that uh, with that or can you prioritize yes. those things in your yes comfort? yes so i would say that multidisciplinary centers plus the notion of faculty from unconventional uh, sources whether they are professional faculty professionally trained professors of practice or they are just visiting faculty or they are online courses that then can enrich the mix if you were just to try all of these combinations then you get this going students will naturally uh, want to also do multidisciplinary programs and so on so i think that's the last piece that the administrators have to address is how do you create programs in that can be uh, truly multidisciplinary and meet student demand so for example at ashoka we've just joined launched a course in computer science and philosophy <laughs> now you may say why philosophy but as you can see all in computer science and in data given even in our own country there's been such so much debate about the ethics of data privacy or of, of uh, artificial intelligence and so on so that's a very interesting discipline that students want to explore uh, and also is applicable that, to the real world i don't know uh, you've heard the term philosopher engineer you know uh, it's been a 
yes. term that's yes. been used yes. actively uh, to specify that the problem of engineering is no longer, especially in the bits and bytes world, is no longer a problem of programming, but it's a problem of actually thinking at a higher uh, level, you know, thinking at a society or a population level or thinking even at a global level. And that that thinking cannot yeah. come from any other discipline but philosophy in that sense. Because you're actually yeah. addressing core facts and core fundamental first principles in that sense. So just to kind of look at uh, Ashoka University, you're saying that Ashoka University is focusing on a center of excellence here. And so that means yeah. going forward, you will be- We have multiple more. centers of excellence. Yeah. Multiple we have centers. created multiple centers. So is there, a, is there a center for public policy? Are you raising money for public policies? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. But uh, uh, several of our centers do inform policy because the approach we have taken is that if you are working on an issue that is a national issue or a public issue, then naturally you will start to inform public policy in that area. So you don't need a center for public policy to do public policy. Right? Absolutely. That's the, that, that, that's the whole point. That's the, for interdisciplinary yeah. school, that should be the way it should operate. But the outcome, I mean, at scale is always to solve large problem is it's typically public policy, if not behavior change or regime change. Yeah. So we have a center for, uh, we actually have a very interesting center for behavior change. Uh, which deals a lot with public policy, works a lot with the government in helping them fine tune their programs. How do you get people to change behavior, right? Uh, how do you get people who are illiterate or don't understand to take their medicines on time or to take their vaccination on time? Uh, how do you roll out public programs where behavior change is required? And they do, they bring a lot of scientific thinking in the design of policy, you know, the all of the stuff from behavior economics and cognitive science uh, that has become very popular around the world. So does that mean that uh, Ashoka will raise more money for these centers than for hostels going forward? No, I don't even know the math. And that's not a statement I would agree or disagree with. I, I don't know. I've never looked at it that way. We have to first and foremost uh, take care of our students. So uh, we... I'm just we, kind of we, uh, looking at the uh, I mean, looking at the hard part of it and the soft part of it. And yeah, least, but we don't look at it that way. Yeah. yeah, but Yatish, what I'm saying is we don't look at it that way, right? So uh, I think we have a clear plan of growing our student base uh, from where we are right now, which is about 2,700 students. So probably doubling that in the near term. So yes, we will build hostels for them and the infrastructure for them. And that's very much, I think it's important for a university that wants to make an impact and build a global reputation to have a minimum scale. So that too we will do in terms of building the classrooms and the buildings for the hostels for these students. But equally, uh, uh, for us, it's very important that our research really uh, makes a mark as well. Uh, no university achieves global reputation, national reputation, even without research. So these centers really help drive research while, while faculty do their own research and drive themselves to do research. I think the centers is one way to also uh, drive research. And so we'll do both but I don't think we've looked at it from how much here and how much there. Okay. So thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sina, for being with us today and telling us not just about Ashoka, but also about the larger challenge that uh, universities face. Thank you, Amir, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it.